Welcome to the third video in the series of introductory videos for SolidCAM. Today's topic will be the setup of a new CAM part. So first we start with a SolidWorks part. And to begin SolidCAM, we'll go to Tools, SolidCAM, New. And from here, you choose the module that you'll be programming in. So milling, turning, mill turn, or wire. In this case, we're going to go with milling. So the first one that you'll see here is the setup of the part. Now we can choose between external and internal parts. Now, if you don't know what the difference is, I, I'll refer you to video one in the series where I describe exactly the difference between internal and external. Today, I'm just gonna go with external. Next is the name of the actual part. You'll see that the name is taken from the SOLIDWORKS name. But if you wanna change it in any way, you can do so in this window. I'll be saving this part, this external part, in the model file directory. That is by default, but if I'd like to save this anywhere else, I can uncheck this box and it'll save it to the default location that I set up in the global software settings. Again, I'll refer you to video one for where you can find that address. Or I can browse to it to a specific folder for this part only. Uh, and then the units that I'll be programming in. So once I click the green check mark, I'll close the original SOLIDWORKS part and open up the design model, my perfect copy of the original SOLIDWORKS part. I'll be able to add sketches to this, insert any additional solids to represent vices and whatnot, pretty much anything that I'd like to add to get this part to be machined. Okay, so the next window is the actual definition of this part. We'll begin by choosing the post processor. So the SolidCam comes with a list of default CNC machines and their associated post processor. If you don't find your machine on this list, I'll refer you to the post department where they can create one specific to your make and model and any cycles you'd like to see in your G-code. For today's video, I'm just gonna go with the Haas SS3X. Next is the coordinate system. This will be the coordinate system we're gonna to use to locate the part on your machine. Essentially your X, your Y, and your Z zeros. So, good coordinate system. And we've got five options. Again, all we're doing here is just using whatever geometry we have available to us in order to orient the Z axis or in our case, the z-axis is our tool axis. The first option is select face. And what we're doing here is we're just going to choose a face, a flat face, that we will place a z-axis perpendicular to. So I've made it easy on myself. I've got a block that represents my stock, so I'm just going to choose the top face of that stock. I have it set to place the coordinate origin to the top corner of that box, but we do have various options here that will basically put the coordinate origin anywhere on the part as specified here. The only standout here is if you were doing turning or any kind of mill turn, or if you wanted to locate off of a hole, you could use center of revolution face. And essentially what that does is it will find the center of any revolved face, any hole, any curvature, any cylinder, and it'll play, place the Z axis in, the, in the, um, the center of that hole or the center of that cylinder. Otherwise, the rest of them are very self-explanatory. Top corner model box, bottom corner, and top center. Now that I've placed my coordinate system there, I can use these other options on the side here to change the location. So in this case, I can say pick origin, let's say at that corner there, and then my X and Y are not in the right direction, so I can flip around Z and get them to be in that direction. Now, if I wanted to shift them even further, I have modify by delta or modify by rotation. Again, you'll put in numbers there to shift the location of the origin. And that is just the select face option. That's if I had a prismatic part that had flat faces. If I did not have that, if I had an, um, a geometry that had more curvature, tapers, there's really no flat face that I could use to orient my z-axis, then I have the other options here. Define allows me to choose an origin, and then I can choose the x direction. So I choose a line that represents the x direction, and then the next option is the y direction, and then by default, I'll have a z-axis pointing in that direction. Likewise, with the three-axis uh, three points associated, I'll be choosing points to represent the same thing. So origin, I can choose that or that point right there as my origin. X direction, in this case, I'm picking a point in the X direction, and then a point in the Y direction. And then my result will be a Z axis pointing straight up. And that is associative, meaning that if those points along this geometry change in the original SOLIDWORKS part, my coordinate system will change to match that. Select coordinate system, if I had a SOLIDWORKS coordinate system, 
from my designer or I designed it myself that I would like to use for a machining coordinate system. I can select it from the list. I do not have any on this part, so I do not have anything in my list. And then lastly, normal to view is very useful for any kind of multi-axis work. Essentially what this is, is if you angle your part a certain way, it will place the z-axis positive out of the screen. And that'll be helpful when you're doing any kind of five-axis work where you need to be concerned with clearances and that sort of thing. But for today's video, let's just go back to select face, top corner of model box. I'm just going to choose the top face of my stock model, and that'll be there. That's it. What we've created here is my Mac 1 position 1, or on my Haas machine, my G54, my first offset. The Mac number is associated with the setup. So this part is currently sitting with this face up. That's my Mac 1. And my position 1 is really just the first position of this Mac. Now, if I had subsequent positions, those would just be indexed planes in this same offset. So if I were doing any kind of fourth axis or five axis work. If I had a Mac 2, let's just create a second coordinate system. So that means Mac 2. Essentially, what that should mean is that I've taken the part out and I'm setting it up again. So a second offset. And we'll just do the same thing. Select face, that edge right there. Mac 2, position 1, or G55. Now you see with both coordinate systems, it automatically read from the solid the upper level, or in this case, on this Mac position, the upper level is that top face there as 0. It knows the height of my part, so it put it as lower level is the height of that part, so negative 1.625. And then these are default settings from my global uh, software settings. Clearance level is 1 inch above my 0, tool start level is 5 inches above that, and so on. Again. You can refer to um, the global settings to see how you can affect these, these numbers right here. Once I click the green check mark, I'll accept my coordinate systems. So those are my side one and side two. And we can continue on with the further definition of the part. So next is the stock. The stock is the raw material that we're going to be making this part out of. And again, we've got five options. And again, there, the options are based off of the geometry that is available to us. In this case, uh, if you had a STL format of a file that represents a forging, a casting, or any kind of oddball geometry that you have point cloud data on, an STL format file, you can bring that in here and you can use that as the material you're going to machine to achieve this final part. If you do not have STL and you have any other format, say a, a Parasolid, a Step, an IGES, and you've converted it to a SOLIDWORKS file, or you've just modeled it yourself in SOLIDWORKS to represent the part that's going to be machined, you can click on 3D model and then select that solid. In this case, I do have a solid, this box that I've created to represent my stock. And if I click show, it'll just show me that that is the box definition. That is the solid that represents the billet that I'm putting on my machine. Extruded boundary is if we were working with an extrusion, we were machining an extrusion to achieve this part, I can choose the outer edge of the part, or any edge of the part that represents the extruded boundary. And again, I'm just going to do auto constant Z, or constant Z propagation, to find the, uh, the contour. And then what will happen is it will extrude that contour to represent the entire part. So it extruded that contour to give us that extruded cross section. And we can now use that as a stock model to machine to achieve our part. The other two options, the cylinder and the box option, are very basic definitions of a stock. Cylinder is used in turning and box is used in milling. So we'll use box here and you'll see how they both work. Essentially what they do is they're relative to the model. I can choose the model and it'll place a minimum amount of material box around that part. That is an incremental part, uh, uh, incremental dimensional box. You can see that it's flush with those sides because I have it set to zero in the increments. But if I wanted to, say, put material on the outside edges, I can add any material I want. So in this case, I'm just going to add 100 thou on all the edges and maybe 300 thou on the bottom so I can hold that in, in a vise. And you can see the green sketch represents that billet. Now, again, that's an incremental value. If I know the actual dimensions of the billet that I'm going to put on my machine, I can switch this to absolute coordinates. And you can see that using the coordinate system that I defined a second ago, I'll be creating that stock boundary. So again, I can put in, let's say, five inches, another five inches, 
and so on. And you can see that I'm creating a box relative to that coordinate system. Now, my suggestion is if you know the absolute coordinates of your, of your part, a 3D model actually might be the easier option because then you can define it in SOLIDWORKS and you are associative to that box as well. Meaning that if I were to change the billet size at all, I could just go to my model in SOLIDWORKS, change the dimensions, and then it'll carry over to my stock definition inside my external solid cam part. So I'm going to click the green check mark to accept that. And then next, for a basic definition, is just the target. And all that is, is a solid representing the final piece. In this case, that piece right there. This representation will be used in any of my verifications or any of my analyses to tell me that if I've gouged the part or if I have any additional material that still needs to be removed. Once I click the green check mark, I will have defined my part. So that is all that's required for the basic definition of a part for any kind of 2D, 2.5D, or 3D toolpath. In later videos, I will actually show you how to define uh, information for the purpose of iMachining. But the purpose of this video is the basics for all of SolidCam. So just the corner system, the stock, the target. Once I click this green check mark, I will fully define the part and I can begin to add toolpaths. But at any point, if I need to return to add additional corner systems or to redefine my stock or my target, they exist here separately. Or if I need to check my overall definitions, I can always double click on cam part and return to that same window. So it's at this point that we can add toolpaths. Look forward for other videos in the series for each one of these toolpaths and the basics behind them. As always, if you have any additional questions as you're going along with programming of parts, you can always call us at 1-866-975-1115, extension 2. Uh, also, keep in mind there's always the rest of the videos that are specific to various aspects of SolidCam. Thank you for watching.